This episode is sponsored by the Real Estate Foundation of BC. REFBC is a philanthropic organization that supports sustainable, equitable, and socially just relationships with land and water. Learn more about the foundation's grants and initiatives at refbc.com. Welcome back to another episode of the Bigger Than Me podcast. Here is your host, Aaron. Today, I have the honor of speaking with the chief of a Soyuz First Nation. We discuss indigenous politics, economic development, work ethic, and how to support First Nation communities in their economic success. My guest today is Chief Clarence Louis. It is not every day that we get to sit down with a living legend, an individual who inspires so many different First Nations communities. Chief Clarence Louis, would you mind briefly introducing yourself for people who might not be acquainted with your work? Hello, everyone. I'm Chief Clarence Louis from the Sioux Indian Band, and I've been chief of this community for 38 years. Uh, everybody I know is getting old. I'm getting old, but I love what I do, and I love uh, I love creating jobs and making money for this Sioux Indian Band. I love it. There's one area, and I'm sure you've seen it go viral again and again. It kind of resurfaces. There's this Facebook post. Um, with words from you talking about the mindset you have, the philosophy you have around Indian time, around hard work. Do you know about the post that I'm talking about and the impact that it's had? I don't know if it's if it's the same one, but if it's the one titled Indian Time, which was a a Globe and Mail reporter, um, Roy Roy McGregor, who helped me with my book. He's uh, I don't know if he still works for the Globe and Mail, but he was a writer for the Globe and Mail at the time, and he just happened to be in the, in the audience up in Fort McMurray area where I was speaking to a off the res to a group, and uh, yeah, and he he wrote an article, and he titled it Indian Time because I was uh, making an issue about Indians showing up late, which they were doing at that at, at that gathering too, and. Uh, yeah, so he titled it Indian Time, and uh, yeah, it's, it's still making the rounds all, all these years later. I found it really inspiring and really important because we can so often get kind of siloed within our Indigenous communities, and there are business practices that are best practices that we should try and align ourselves with in order to compete on bids, in order to gain respect and confidence from other communities, whether it's other municipalities or the province. And so it just was really inspiring to see you voicing something that I don't feel like we hear very often from Indigenous leaders. Well, if, if everyone on, I've, I've been on over 300 Indian reserves, Indian reservations, both sides of the border, Canada and the States. And wherever you go, um, north, south, east and west Indian country, everybody on the res complains about Indian time. Yeah. You know, it's a it's a sad joke. And, you know, people still joke around about it even today on every res I've ever been on. So within the res community, everybody knows of Indian time or or Navajo time or Cree time or and uh yeah and it's uh it's something that still sadly happens today where you 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 can't hold a job if you can't show up on time yeah. I mean obviously when you're a student when you're in grade school or high school you're you're not going to be a good student if you if you don't show up on time in fact that's what grade school and preschool is supposed to teach you you know the number one rule you know show show up on time. I love that. Would you mind taking us back to your roots, uh, your youth in a Soyuz, uh, working in the vineyard, coaching sports? Can you talk about your early life? Well, my early life on this reserve was no different than most uh, First Nation reserves. Um, we didn't have much. Uh, everybody was pretty poor. Actually, uh, the CC band, we, we, were, we were lucky to probably, uh, I don't know, of any other band that can say in 1968 that they had their own band business and we had a vineyard. And, uh, it was a small vineyard at the time, but now it's grown to be one of the biggest privately owned vineyards in the country at around 300 acres. But yeah, we, we had a band business. Um, we're, we're located right down by the US Canada border. So when there's no jobs on the res, all of our, you know, grandparents, uh, parents, they they cross that border and go work in the States and follow the fruit. Some of our people would follow the fruit picking all the way down to Arizona, California, and then make and then make make their way back home. 
So most of my people back in the 60s, 70s, 50s, they all worked in Washington, usually Washington State, sometimes further south. We have band members uh, from Texas. In fact, one of the, some of the state's band members were in my office yesterday. And they sound like Texans because that's where they grew up. Because somehow one of my people ended up following the, the food industry all, all the way down to Texas. Yeah, so back in my early days, I mean, everyone worked, even though it was hard labor, mostly in the, you know, in the orchard industry, fruits, uh, apple, apple uh, packing houses, or also in, in logging and forestry. And yeah, and everybody on the res, when you were old enough to work, you your first job usually as a teenager was working in the vineyard, right. which you, when you got off school in the summertime, July and August was get up at four o'clock in the morning, be out in those fields by 5 a.m. and get off at 1 a.m. And, and all of us back in my era and even before mine and even up until probably the early 80s when we started branching out into other businesses, pretty much everybody had a taste of working in the vineyard, which which I think is a, it, it, it's hard work. Um, most people don't like it. I didn't like it, but it teaches you a lot. You know, everyone needs to go through some, uh, have a good, tough work experience as a youth. And that's why I'm a big believer in youth summer jobs. Um, they, uh, they, they they teach you a lot and they lifelong lessons you can carry into any other, any other field of work that you happen to be into. But yeah, doing hard labor is, a, everyone as a youth should do some hard labor. And it's too bad today that youth are getting, uh, lazy in the sense that they don't want to do hard labor i mean i look at some of the youth on this res and we have so many opportunities now and even uh the past few summers part of our youth have a chance of their summer job is is learning tech learning technology and sitting in front of a screen in one of our boardrooms downstairs in front of a laptop which they get to keep after the end of the summer and they get to listen to people from Microsoft, from BlackBerry. And I always remind them, I said, you you youth are so lucky nowadays. You, you don't even have to break a sweat. You're sitting in front of a screen. You're not in the, you know, in 40 degree heat. You're not in the wind and the rain in those vineyards with a shovel or a hoe in your hand getting all dusty and dirty. And you're not having to get up at four o'clock in the morning. You come here during the easy band office hours, 8.30 to 4.30 and and you get paid, that's your summer job? Oh, wow, man. Kids of my era would have would never have thought that, uh, because we, we all just did labor work. We, we all did hard labor. And and even now, um, every vineyard has to import Mexicans because uh, Canadians don't want to do labor work. Yeah. So we're having to import, we have a Mexican work program where we're important Mexicans uh, to work in the fields. So you, it's, it, 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 it kind of bothers me that uh, today's youth don't get a taste of hard grunt labor work as a 12-year-old, 13-year-old, 14-year-old. They get to sit in air-conditioned offices looking at screens, getting paid way more than two bucks an hour. That's <laughs> all I got paid. It was two bucks an hour to sweat it out in those fields and but at the same time, you know, it's evolution and it's um, it's kind of cool that our people don't have to sweat in the fields anymore to to have a summer job. You're a person you're a person who's very well known for your work ethic. And so I'm wondering, is this where you developed this work ethic from working in the vineyards, coaching sports, supporting your community? Oh, of course, of course. I mean, anytime you work in agriculture or forestry or logging, you're getting up early. It's not the easy office hours, the easy grade school hours, I call them. You're, you know, you're getting up at three or four in the morning and uh, you're having to be out there on the work site. And, Awesome training program as a young person. Even though I hated it, I'm glad I went through it. And sometimes in life, the uh, the stuff you didn't like probably taught taught you the most. You know, the the rough the 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 rough goal that you had as a youth. You know, so um, my my people, most of my people, not 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 all, 
but most of my people ha have a good hard work ethic, you know, because that's how they grew up. You know, there was there, there used to be no no welfare on Indian reserves. You know, you had uh, work or you starved, and um, and and I think is one of the old chiefs told me one of the worst things they ever brought to Indian reserves was, was welfare. It made some of our people lazy. It made some of our people not want to work, even though you don't get much on welfare, but still having too many safety nets in any society, uh, it, it it's not good. You know, people um, should have to work for a living. In fact, all of our, I mean, if you go back to to prior to the non-natives be, being in our territory, we had to provide, we had to, whether it's hunting, fishing, food gathering, whatever, you had to provide for your three basic needs, food, clothing, and shelter. Yeah. You didn't have, not break a sweat again, go down to Walmart, which we call the Indian store. <laughs> you couldn't just go down to the Indian store and buy whatever you wanted. You know, if you wanted meat, you had to get up and get up early and go hunting and you had to, skin that deer, pack that deer out, or moose or elk. And um, traditional living isn't easy. It's way harder than contemporary living, way harder. Absolutely. You know, no one built your house. You built it yourself. Um, you didn't just go down and buy clothes that were already made. You had to make your own clothes. In fact, some of the old people here still remember um their grandmas and moms making moccasins. And making moccasins isn't easy. Yeah. And uh, some of them remember that they that they had to wear moccasins as, as a child. And you know, it's it's so much easier wearing runners. <laughs> you know, so no, but but that that's why one one of my one of my quotes that it's hanging in our boardroom and or just for our boardroom, natives have always worked for a living. You know, our people didn't sit on their ass with their hand out. There was no welfare. No, no. There was no safety net. Um, you you worked. And all of our old people used to have gardens. You had to grow your own food. Um, or, or, or else you starved. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the Native work ethic uh, used to be strong and it's weakened a, a bit because uh, our people have gotten softer because of, again, the safety nets that are provided by bands today that our people never had. You went to Saskatchewan Indian College, and this is where you fell in love with First Nations history and the culture and the, the traditions. It seems like at times our interest in economic development is faced almost juxtaposed to our ability to practice our culture. And you hear that a lot within communities, that these are somehow at odds with each other. And I don't agree with that, but I'm curious as to what your takeaways were from going to the college and how we find this balance. I don't agree with it or at odds either. Um, traditionally, our people had, had an economy um we had a system of trade i mean trade is still used as a word today back then i mean the the oldest ancestral grave found in our territory not far from osuyus proved to be over 1500 years old and in that ancestral grave no different than ancestral graves throughout north america what was found in that grave didn't come from the Okanagan Nation Territory. What was found in that grave didn't come from Washington State. It came from further south. So obviously that proves archaeological evidence proves over and over again that our tribes, our nations had a system of trade. Trade is just another word for business. Our people traded with each other. We had a system of trade routes, trade routes. Um, we did trade with uh, other tribes, other nations. We have a word for buffalo in our language, but there's no buffalo in the Okanagan. But we have a word for buffalo in our language because we traded with the Plains people. We went over those Rockies. So really, we were the first entrepreneurs of this land 
not the French or the English. We were the first business people. We had, we had a, in fact, one of the Mohawks told me, one of the Mohawks chiefs told me many years ago that they even had a system of taxation. They didn't use that word taxation. That's an English word. If they had a system of taxation for uh, the French and the English, uh, the missionaries, when they came through their territory, they taxed them. They didn't speak English. They only spoke Mohawk, but they had a system of tax. Again, that's that that's that's economics. Um, so every tribal territory had a had business people. We had specialists. Um, we had a system of trade. And in the modern way, in the modern res way, to me, it's just uh, it is one of the national chiefs once said. It's the economic horse that pulls the social cart. Well, yes, it is. But most of our people don't realize that. They, they're trying to put the cart before the horse. You know, they all talk about all these social programs, social elders programs, youth programs, education. Everything costs money. Health costs money. I've never met a teacher that works for free. Nurses and doctors don't work for free. Everybody wants a paycheck. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's just normal and natural. Everybody wants a paycheck. Even even when I see healers, these native healers that go around, we have to pay them. Nobody, unless you're going to live off of welfare, the majority of our people want a decent paycheck. And they have to realize that those paychecks that come from, and even if you work in social services or our schools or in education, that paycheck comes from somewhere. I mean, the the money that the funded money that goes into health and education comes from economic development, comes from corporate taxes, comes from personal taxes, natural resource taxes. Everything, if if, if you connect the dots, it all goes back to economic development, because. Unless you're a third world country dependent on foreign aid, which I know Canada and America and most G8 countries, they end up giving money, they ended up giving some of their economic development money to these needy countries because they depend on foreign aid. Yeah. But every government, I don't care if it's a federal government, provincial government, municipal governments, First Nation governments, Every government needs money to operate. And if you connect the dots, where does that money come from? It doesn't just fall out of the sky. People, you know, it just bugs me that natives can't connect the dots. They can't connect the dots of where where does this money come from to pay my teachers or to pay our uh, social service staff or or where, where's the money come for youth programs, elders programs on it? When we bury people, where's that money come from? It comes from economic development it comes from business development yeah. that's where all the money comes from to run the federal provincial and municipal first nation governments money just doesn't fall out of the sky it comes from economic development this was actually one of the lessons that i took away i was a native court worker for about five years and trying to help people through the legal system help them with their court matters whether it was a domestic violence charge or whether it was a theft under charge and i was trying to help them and it just always felt like well we need more housing we need more social programs we need more of this and it just felt like i was in a never-ending rat race of trying to help people get out from that system and get into a social program and it seemed like there must be a solution to this problem beyond just doing the same kind of approach every day and then I had the opportunity to go to law school in Vancouver and study this and economic development to your point was exactly the solution for indigenous communities it is the engine and in so many communities including my own community we treat it like it's another portfolio like housing like social programs like health care but it's not it's very much the program that allows everything else to be paid for it allows communities to get out from under um, waiting for checks to come in from the federal government or the provincial government. It allows that economic freedom to go, 
where do we want our community to be in 10 years? And then to start to uh, make a budget on how we want to get there over the next 10 years. And that's freeing. But when we treat it like it's just another portfolio, it keeps us small minded and kind of gets us to check boxes and not have a good strategy around it. Moving into oh, your oh, poor, poor people aren't free. Yeah. Dependent people are not free. So obviously, do you, do you want to be an independent First Nation or a dependent First Nation? Do you want to be dependent on government grants and programs and services, which have never worked for our people? Yeah. There's not one program that the federal government go back 100 years, even this year. There's not one program that the federal government properly funds. Yeah. They never have and they never will because there's just not enough money to go around. So First Nations got to start making their own money. You got to start making your own money and getting back on your economic horse. It is the economic horse that pulls the social cart. Always has been and always will be. And as I mentioned, that ancestor, this grave I was talking about, those things in there were based on economics and trade. Yeah. We got to get back on our economic horse. I mean, it's pretty simple. The, uh, the, the dependency model, the dependency trap, was created by how you colonize a people. I don't care if it's Africans, Asians, North American Indians, South American Indians, whether it's the British, French, the Spaniards, or whoever. If you want to colonize a people, the first thing you have to do is take away their economic ability to support themselves. You take away their economics. That's how you make people dependent. And you turn them into what's often referred to as hang around the Ford Indians. Indians were turned into hang around the Ford Indians. Hang around Department of Indian Affairs. Hang around these forts for, for rations, for uh, for trinkets, for, uh, you know, that, 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 that's how you turn Native people into beggars in their own land is you take away their economics. That that that's the colonial recipe. Yeah. It's been done over and over again all over the world. Would you mind telling us about your first run for chief, what your mindset was, what your philosophy was? You're nearly 40 years in. I'm just wondering about those early days of considering putting your name forward. Boy, that was so long ago. I I, I really don't I don't remember. I just knew that uh, I had a good work ethic. Uh, my mom had the old tough res rule that it's, we've gotten away from. You either go to school, get a job, or you get out. And I know for one of our members that has now become the world's first First Nation winemaker, his dad did the same thing to him. He was being a lazy youth. And his dad kicked him out. I mean, uh, tough love often works. And in all of our First Nation stories, and I've heard it so many times about the willow stick, about uh, grandparents making their, their grandchildren, you know, stand on their own two feet. You know, it's the same thing if you look at the animals. Eagles teach their young how to fly, not so they can hang around them, so they can be out on their own. They 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 push them out of the nest eventually. They they push them out. And and, and that and that youngster has to fly on its own. And and that's the then that's 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 tra traditional teachings where our people I don't care what, what tribe you talk about, our people were not lazy. Our people weren't lazy people. We we weren't hanging around the Ford Indians. The federal and provincial governments forced us to be hanging around the Ford Indians. But now we should be out of that era and uh getting back on our economic course and uh looking at every business opportunity that that we can get into and, and, and even here at osuyus we still have that mindset of 
not being able to connect the dots, many of our people, and not and, and thinking that, you know, business is easy and making money is easy. And, you know, I mean, so many bands have gotten land claims and lots of money. And then in, in a matter of years, just like some bands in Alberta have told me, they went from poverty, extreme poverty, to extreme wealth in terms of money, oil money. But all they did was was give it out in per capitas. Yeah. And to me, a per ca- if you give out too much per capitas, that's just a bigger form of a welfare check. That's not teaching your people how to be independent. You're becoming dependent on per capitas. So they gave out these huge per capitas. Kids were turning 18, year old, 18 years old, 19, and getting six-figure checks. What happens with most teenagers, and you got to remember, an 18 or 19-year-old is still a teenager. What happens to most teenagers when you give them $100,000, $200,000 check? Is that good or bad? You know, there, there, there's a lot of... It, it, if people don't have to work for their money, they're, they're, they're not going to learn how to manage money. They're not going to have a work ethic. I couldn't agree more. One of the areas that I find really important to understand and I'd like your take on is the process of elections within Indigenous communities. I find within my own community and within many others, there's a couple of families with big last names that are well recognized, and then the community votes for them based on their last name, but not based on their ideas that they're bringing forward. And from my understanding, you ran on two platforms, one to create jobs and two to make the community money. And I tried to bring a similar mindset when running for council was I'm going to do all candidates meetings. People can ask me why I'm running, what I'm hoping to contribute, the work that I plan to do if I'm elected, how I'm going to make a difference. Don't vote for me for my last name. Vote for me based on my ideas. How do we think about this? Well, in my book, Res Rules, I believe in rules. You know, every successful person has rules. Every, every good house has house rules. You can't play sports without rules. Yeah. You know, so I, so, so I believe in rules. That's why my book's called Res Rules. But I have a chapter there about res elections. And it bothers me that our elections are getting, it, as much as we complain about white people, Man, we sure we sure we sure model them, and we sure in in our elections are getting just as stupid as it is the non-native elections. There was this, uh, you know, of course on the internet you can you always get sent stuff, but I got sent this one this one cartoon about a res election. It was a button. There was there was a a, a red button and a white button, something like that, and the caption was. Uh, it's election time on, on the res. Vote for your cousin. It was a white button. Red button was vote for somebody who knows what they're doing. But yeah, you're right. I mean, and, and then res elections get, uh, you know, people making promises. I mean, in, in, the, in the old native way, when you watch people are... <laughs> Leaders were picked at an early age, and they were trained properly, and all that sort of stuff. But but our but our leaders were had to have qualities. One is a work ethic. If you don't have a work ethic, forget it. Yeah. You shouldn't vote, vote vote for somebody. Never vote for somebody who doesn't have a good that can't hold a job that doesn't have a job. And um. And and you can't vote for people that give what I call the I care speech. I, I get native newspapers. I get newspapers here from from the Navajo Nation, that the biggest res on the world in the world. I get that newspaper twice a month, and I subscribe to other native papers. So, so I, I I've collected campaign speeches. I see campaign speeches. I I have never written a campaign speech. My uh, and I've never written a letter for for voting. My my slogan is or my campaign speech is really one sentence. I'll create more jobs and make more money for the Sioux Indian Band than anybody else. That's 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 my campaign speech. That's my uh, campaign letter, which which I've never written one. And um, I'm not against those things, but 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 I've noticed that all campaign speeches say basically the same thing. 
I care about the elders. I care about our language. I care about our land. I care about, you know, youth programs. I, I care, I care, I care. And yet, no one says how, in their campaign letters, how the heck are you going to pay for all that stuff? Because everything costs money. I don't care if it's uh, elders programs, youth programs, education. Even funerals cost money. Everything from A to Z, from cradle to grave, on a res costs money. So unless you're voting, oh, and, and, and I, was, I was in the Navajo Nation once, and in my book, that's one of the pictures I put in my book. I saw this sign, because of course the Navajo Nation, 300,000 members, biggest res in the world. I saw this sign, and I go down there on a motorcycle ride most every year. They were going through an election. I saw this sign that said, uh, vote for jobs, not talk. I thought, that's me. That, that That's my campaign speech. Yeah. Vote for jobs, not talk. That's the way every rest should be. Vote for people that are going to create jobs, not just talk. And you've been in your role for forty, almost 40 years come 2024. How does that feel to have known that that's had the impact and that you've been able to create so many different uh, organizational structures and opportunities for your members? Well, the CUC Indian Band isn't perfect. And, you know, this band office I'm sitting in and even these companies still don't run the way I'd like them to run. Right. Because as a chief, you're, you're, you're not a dictator. Sometimes I wish I could be a dictator. <laughs> Things would get done a lot better, faster, and be in any case. A chief is not a dictator. A chief is not a king or a queen. Uh, we have a five-member council. I always remind people, council rules council. At election time, just don't worry about who the chief is. I I get one voter on that table. And, and in some cases, chiefs aren't even allowed to vote. They chair the meeting and only vote in a break in, in case of a tie. So during election time, I'm actually campaigning more for who gets on council then who's the chief? Right. I have to remind people, you got to think this, you got to think. It's not, the chief does not run, run council. Council runs council. A majority rules are on that council table. So you got to get, you have to be worried about who the council members are, not just who the chief is. I know in many bands here in the Okanagan, the chief only votes in case of a tie. And um, yeah, so... I don't run council, so at election time, I'm just as con just as concerned about if there's a six member council. I want four, at least four, hardworking, good council members in there. Yeah, and that so you you have to be in in even is is somebody that's running on their own like me when I run for chief. As I mentioned, I spend most of my time when I'm out talking to people at election time. I'm talking about the council positions more than the chief position because uh, council runs council and you have to have, uh, you know, hardworking, uh, fair minded. And, 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 and I like it when I hear back East in the Mohawk country that um, they have a word for, for their leaders. I want to say the word chief and council, which are English words. But but uh, what that word means is those who are of the nice. So I remind people, you got to vote for nice people. Not 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 the assholes that run for council. Not 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 the uh, not the bullies. Yeah. You know, not 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 the ones that shout the most and can stand up in band meetings and holler around the most. You vote for people that 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 have a uh, genuine niceness to them. No, not not just. I mean, we're we're, we're kind of lucky in the sense that we're a small res and we're not three hundred thousand people, like 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 the Navajo Nation. Um, pretty much everybody knows each other, and I always remind them. You, you don't even need need to read somebody's campaign speech. If you've been around the res enough, watch what they do. Not during an election, watch what they do and how they are throughout the year. That's their real self. Because our people are getting too phony at election time. They're acting like phony politicians. All of a sudden, they near election time, 
They start attending community events. Before an election, you never see them. They never show up. But at election time, a month before election, all of a sudden they're at community events. I call that being a phony ass. Are, are, you never see them at youth events. But near an election, all of a sudden they're at youth events. Thinking, what a phony ass. <laughs> or, 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 or when there's cultural ceremonies, you never see them. But a month before the election, all of a sudden they're there acting like they really care. You know, you, you got to have eyes wide open at election time and watch people throughout the year and throughout their, tw- you know, is there teenagers? Is there in their 20s and their 30s? Watch them. That's how our old people used to, that's how you, how you traditionally pick leaders was you, you watch them as they're growing up. And, and don't vote for the assholes. You know, if, if, every res has idiots and assholes and what, what they call them haters. I even hear that in some of the native songs and the rap music. We've got haters. Every res has haters. So. You have this amazing campaign slogan, this mindset around leading and making jobs and creating economic opportunities, and you've delivered. You have the most band-owned businesses per capita in all of Canada. Would you mind talking about some of those band-owned businesses and the work that went into creating them? Yeah, we have, uh, of course, our vineyard is still operating. Um, It's growing a lot since 1968. We have a, a joint venture winery with Canada's biggest wine producer, Artera Wines, Vincourt Jackson Treaks. Um, we have a golf course. We have two gas stations and stores, one on the north end of the reserve, one on the south end. Uh, north and south, we have a forestry operation. Uh, we have a cement company. We have, I'm always trying to think of who the managers around our managers' tables here. We have a campground and recreational vehicle park. We have a cultural center. And we have a number of other joint ventures around forestry and and, and, and mining. I think that covers all of them. And we're always looking for for new lease opportunities. We, We lease a lot of land. We're lucky here in the Okanagan, the biggest reserves in BC are all in the Okanagan. So some of our land leases, we lease out a thousand acres just, just in vineyards oh. to different to, 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 to different vineyards. We have an industrial park. Well, it has a provincial prison on it. People often think that's the CCD Banks prison. It's not our prison. But we're the first band to ever allow a prison on an Indian reserve on both sides of the border. It, that turned out to be our biggest land lease we've ever done. Uh, and the reason I push for that prison, even though the, the connotation of, you know, na- natives in prison was because of 250 union paid jobs. You know, anytime there's hundreds of jobs being offered on the res, we should jump all over that. Yeah. And, um, you know, res humor is the best and. And the uh, young res boys were teasing each other. Who's the first associate senior band member that's going to wind up in that jail <laughs> on the associate senior reserve? And uh, yeah, so we have an industrial park, uh, which we're looking to lease more land out. We have residential developments, commercial developments, industrial developments. And uh, we also buy land. Our res is 4,000 acres short, like on most reserves on both sides of the border. After the reserves were established and our ancestors, someone had a say in, 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 in the in the reserves. The government, as more settlers would come in, took away reserve land. And we had uh, 4,000 acres of our best reserve land taken away. And so one of our goals here, one of my goals, is to eventually get up to a 40,000 acre res. We're at 36,000 or something. It's not going to happen during my lifetime, but... I learned that from, from from the tribes in the states, the rich casino tribes have taken that money from casino gaming and buying land and add into their reserve size. Because land is always more important than money. Land is always more important than money. And uh, some people give us shit for having to buy our land back. And I think, you think white people are going to give the land back? Yeah. Give your head a shake. 
<laughs> you think you think some white person that's watched Dances with Wolves eight times is gonna come into your band office and say, Oh my conscience, my conscience got to me. I'm gonna give my house and my land back back to the band. Yeah. That ain't gonna happen. And to me, it's only money. It's that's what I love making money. And 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 our people need to talk about money at every opportunity. It's not having a love of money. The equation stamped in my mind is money equals opportunity. Those dollar signs equal opportunity. So I don't have a love of money. I have a love of opportunity for this CC bed. But in order to have opportunity, you got to have money. Yeah. If you don't have money, you have no opportunity. You can't pay that. I just, I just left a, a meeting and one of our uh, students wants to get her master's. Well, that master's is going to cost tens of thousands of dollars. And where the hell is that money going to come from? Looney auctions? <laughs> You're going to go do loony auctions to pay for your education? And, 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 and we buried one of our people not long ago. That funeral, the band pays for everything. What you, when your people die, you're going to do loony auctions? Leaders have to have to put money as is making money as a priority. Any which way you can make money, but you have to be able to manage money and not do the dumb thing that things that many bands have done. Like I said, go from how, whether it's a land claim or having lots of money. Our people aren't because we were kicked off our economic horse for a hundred years. We have to get back into learning how to make, how to manage money. In fact, uh, I'm amazed, you know, even though, see my Washington Redskins? Yeah. I'm a proud Washington Redskin. I'm a proud Redskin. Uh, and I hope to get that name. And to, to me, that's a proud looking Indian. Agreed. I love that logo. Can I actually ask about that really briefly? You're a person I feel who genuinely speaks their minds, not in a flippant way, but in a very thoughtful way. You just say the truth as you know it to be. And we're in a time where political correctness is a very big thing. And I just find it admirable that you talk about uh, Indian issues. You talk about it openly and honestly. You don't hold back. Where did that kind of philosophy come from for you? And why do you think that's important? Because I'm not a phony politician. There's a big difference be, 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 between being a leader and a politician. I actually don't like that word, politician. Um, I'm not a politician. Somebody who's, who's a politician, I'll watch what they say. They'll gauge, they'll go into a room and, oh, what can I say? I, first, I have to look around before I can tell the truth. Really? You got to look around to be able to tell what you really, really feel. What, what, what's, that, what's that Johnny Cash quote? If you can't say what you truly think, you know, think and feel, then shut the hell up. You know, so so leaders will say what have to be said, even at election time. Politicians will change their their stripes, they'll change their views, they'll even change their core values if it'll get them votes. I don't change my core values to get votes. I don't suck up to people. And uh, there's people on this res that, 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 have, that have never voted for me, which is fine. That's democracy. I don't look to get everybody's vote. In fact, uh, at a recent election, one of the pe people that never vote for me, she says to me, well, you come to my house and tell me why I should vote for you. And I thought, why should I waste my time going to talk to somebody who, who I know is never going to vote for me and is just trying to play some political games, being a phony ass? I don't like, I don't like phony people. I can't stand them. So I'm not going to be phony with anybody. The way I talk right now is the way I talk at band meetings. The way I talk right now is the way I talk at council meetings. Some people say, well, Clarence, uh, uh, do all your elders support you? I said, of course not. And I really don't give a shit if they don't all support me. I'm not looking for everybody's support because I'm not going to be a phony ass. Yeah. I'm not going to change my core values for a vote. And um, people, you know, you, you you get what you get when you vote for me or when you, you know, I, I, 
I'm not a phony person. I hate phony people, and uh, I don't dislike anybody. And even at even after the election, once the election's over, and some people tell me, "Well, how come how come you're helping that person? They didn't vote for you." I said, "I, I really don't care if they didn't vote for me. What they're saying or what they're bringing up is rational and reasonable to me, and I'm going to go along with what, what I'm going to try and help them and go along with what they want, not because they vote." Politicians will look at, oh, did that person vote for me? I'm not a politician. Yeah. I'm a leader. And uh, he's one of the wisest business leaders of all time. Walt, Walt Disney once said, the road to failure is to try and please everybody. In fact, only phony people try and please everybody. So I, I don't try and please everybody. And even, and even when we have votes on, on land designation votes, Sometimes my mom is against the project, which is fine. I don't hate my mom because she voted no, but I'm going to stand up and tell everybody to vote yes. Yeah. And uh, after the vote's over, we still treat each other the same way. I love that because that what that's what leaders do. There, there, there. There's a big difference between being a leader and being a politician. I've taken up far too much of your time already, but one really last question is just around what advice do you have? If you were in an indigenous community, somebody comes in to your office and they go, uh, nothing's working for me. I don't have a job. I don't know where to go. What advice would you have for people tuning in and they just, they don't feel like the world's giving them all the opportunities they want? Well, the first thing they have to do is start with themselves. I mean, um, what sort of job do you want? Um, we employ, last count we did, 30 someone First Nations here. When I see a, a, a First Nation person from another res here, I always ask them, how did you end up here at Osuyus? Well, where I come from, they, all they do is argue and fight there. And the only jobs are the band office jobs or the health jobs or the, or the jobs at the school. We have no economic development. And I didn't want to stand in a welfare line. So that's the type of person that uh, that I'm looking for. They'll always be the lazy asses. Even this res, we 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 have lazy, which, which my mom calls them, lazy asses. You could pay them $100 an hour, they still get their ass fired. But 80, 80 to 90% of my people, and I'm sure on most reserves too, they're hardworking. They want to be hardworking, self-supporting people, law-abiding people. And uh, that's the type of people I love hanging around. And I love, that's, that's why I, I keep on doing, you know, in, in, there is no finish line in business. There is no finish line in personal growth. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting through more books, listening to books than I am reading. Books. I got one of the biggest personal libraries around. I love books. And what I've learned, successful people become successful in, in two major ways the books they read and the people they meet that's how you become successful you got to stay you, you, you got to start hanging around the right people and networking is so important i mean that's why some of the projects i voted for on this res like that racetrack i'm not into ferraris and lamborghinis and those type of cars but when i see somebody that owns a car that's worth five hundred thousand dollars two or three res houses i'm going i'm not interested in that car I'm interested in the person that owns that car because they're obviously a successful business person. Unless they're a drug dealer, how did you how did you get to own a car like that? I'm interested in the person that owns that car. So I'm interested in hanging around business people. Um, I don't go to Union, the BC Chiefs meetings, Summit meetings, the AFN meetings. I'm not saying those meetings aren't important. Of course they are. I send a council member. I send my proxy. You can't do economic development off the side of your desk. You got to be immersed in it. You got to be, you got to live and breathe it. And so I, I, I stay away from from political meetings. They're important, but I spend my time on the business side of the scale, and I love hanging around business people. I love hanging around successful people. I mean, I just got Schwarzenegger's other book. He's the only guy in the world I know that. Uh, made it to the top in three totally different fields, right. sports, bodybuilding. He became the highest paid actor during his height. He spoke broken English, and he still became the highest paid actor. Yeah. 
yeah. male actor at one time. And then in politics, he ran as far as he could. Is a foreigner. He became the governor of the, what did he say, the sixth biggest economy in the world. California, the state of California, sixth biggest economy in the world. I mean, who does that? And he just put out a new book called um, Seven Ways to Become Successful or something like that. Yeah. So I got it and I just finished listening to it. Brilliant. And um, that's what I love. I love listening and learning about successful people and how they became successful and um, hanging around successful people. And that's what I want First Nations to do is to get involved in the business world because that's where the action is. That's where independence is. Hanging around and, you know, uh, uh, clitching on. I mean, we've got a king now, but clitching on to the queen's skirt and thinking the queen's going to solve all, is going to get your people up out of poverty i mean i still hear some old timers say oh we, we gotta go to we, we, it, 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 it. our treaties are with the queen or the king and that, that that's that's uh that's not gonna work yeah. all successful bands i've studied in tribes i've studied have a strong economic arm sure you gotta have a social arm but your strongest arm should be your business arm that's how you get away from being a hanger around the 40 and, and uh, find a job you love. If you, you know, the one sentence I love hearing from my people and I've heard it over and over again is when somebody can honestly say, I love my job. Yeah. Those four words, you're going to be a success. You're going to have a good life. You're going to be a damn good worker. You're going to be very good at what you do. It doesn't matter what you do. I have a bus driver that says, I love my job. He's never missed a day's work in 20 years. And he has a very important job bringing our future managers and, and workers to that preschool I'm looking at across my office here into that into that grade school. Right. Every job is important on the rest. Every job is. And uh, if somebody can say that they that they love their job, they're going to have a good life and they're going to be a, they're going to contribute to raising the standard of, of living on, on your first nation. And, then that's, and and that's what I hope for all of my young people is to find a job that they love, you know, go, 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 go find a job that you have a passion for. And, and, and I read this quote, I, I, I love quotes. There was this quote in the newspaper not long ago that said, the dancer is great, not because of her technique. The dancer is great because of her passion. You know, so you have a passion for your work, and I have a passion for my work. I love creating jobs, and I love it when I see one of my young people um, pick a career and say, that's what I'm going to do for most of my life. And they might change their career later on, but so many of my people have... Uh, whether it's in golf, we sent a, during COVID, we sent one of our young guys to this very expensive golf pro management course, Southern California. He came to the council table, cried, said, if he doesn't do it now, he won't, he doesn't know when he'll do it. Can the band send him to this very expensive golf, golf management program? And we did, and he was successful. Now he's working in our golf course. He said, that's what he wants to do for the rest of his life is, uh, be a golf pro and eventually manage a golf course. So I, I love it when I see Native people, whether it's my own people or I don't care if they're who they are. When a Native person finds a job they love, wow. You know, two thumbs up to that. And uh, that's, that's what every Native person needs to do. And hundreds of years ago, before the white people came, we uh, looked after ourselves. We got up early, went to bed early, got up early, and we uh, we worked. Every day was a work day yeah. because you, you you had to make your own clothes, food, and get your own food, and have your own shelter. So, you know, First Nations people come from a what I call a working culture. Yeah, we come from a working culture, and that's that's what we got to get back to. 
I love it. I cannot thank you enough. Your quote is saying a healthy person is a working person. And I think that philosophy is so important. And there's so much to take away from your journey and the work you're doing to support your members in reaching their full potential, which I think is so important. I highly recommend people go check out your book, Rise Rules. I think it's really important and really helps connect people with that entrepreneurial mindset and how we can support communities in thriving and growing and, and impacting our economies and contributing in a good way. So thank you again i've kept you far too long but i really appreciate oh, there you saw, like you yeah, i like your i like your tone i like your your enthusiasm and uh i want to see my uh great grandfather's reservation res one of these days that it would be an honor to host you in zero i i have to get to your res next year in 2024 and i will my, my auntie with me as well i'll send out that invitation and we will make sure it's a warm welcome it's such an honor to spend this time with you take care